Let's uh, join in sending love to these incredible beings who serenaded us. Cooper Madison, the Gondorbos. I didn't get a chance to um, properly introduce them at Bhakti Fest, uh, Shakti Fest, because there were some technical difficulties. But what I wanted to say, I'll say tonight, that uh, there's a lot of people who um, who can sing, but uh, they don't walk the talk outside of the mat or the microphone or the tucket. And Cooper Madison, absolutely, I've seen it, I've experienced it. He really walks his path. Yeah, it's a life's work for him, so I really honor him for that, and uh, all of us. So welcome. Uh, we want to include, we're in a very intimate space tonight, and very, very grateful to be here, uh, courtesy of uh, our dear friend Philippe and Earth Week. Thank you so much for having us tonight. It's a very, very sacred, beautiful space. So it's very intimate. We'd like to be able to include everyone in this um, this cave of the heart here. So if we could all move up uh, as as far up as possible, it would be even better. And uh, cheaper than going to India, you know, <laughs> very authentic experience. <laughs> so yeah, if we can move up, so we can make room for um, people who are just arriving now, and want to be able to include them. Thank you. So welcome again, and uh, we're being uh, brought together tonight, uh, as well as with Earthly and Philippe, um, our dear, dear, uh, our dear friends on the path, Bhakti Fest. Um, grateful for Bhakti Fest for uh, turning this mic a little bit, a little high, a little down. Thank you. Thank you. So this evening is presented by Bhakti Fest, and uh, Bhakti Fest now we're entering a very, very special year in September. Um, it's four days in the sacred vortex of Joshua Tree, where we do these sacred practices of um, calm response, mantra chanting, kirtan, and yoga, and many of the world leaders from both traditions, uh, unlike any other festival in the world, come together over four days, and it's really amazing. And of course, the, uh, the leaders here tonight um, will be there, it's really exciting. And um, there's some very, very special additions. Uh, Manas Yahoo is opening Thursday night. And that's going to be amazing. Um, and uh, one of the most world-renowned, respected, revered artists in the world, in world music, Salif Keita, will also be joining us this year, one of Peter Gabriel's for your artists and your world recording artists. Now's definitely a good time to make sure our cell phones can shut up, especially in times like that. And then you can get that out of the way right now. We're gonna go very deep together. So but yeah, just double check that our phones are um, preferably off, but if not off, uh, mute it for sure. Let's give ourselves a, a much due respite from the noise outside and uh, we could get even closer together. But anyway, uh, Bhakti Fest is happening. It's the weekend after Labor Day. Um, there's no festival like it in the world. Um, how many of us have been to Bhakti Fest before? And uh, we know what it's like. And for those of us who haven't been, let's, let's all come together in the Sacred Joshua Tree Vortex uh, this September. Um, you can get uh, tickets uh, right at the booth right outside. and. Uh, all incredible Bhakti Fest and apparel and artifacts from India, meditation cushions. And I uh, also briefly want to mention, we live in a, an extraordinarily abundant place for awakening. And we have just, you know, like our leader tonight, just from all over the world, these great masters come to us. We don't have to go to them, it's really great. So I want to mention that uh, Amachi is going to be uh, coming to Los Angeles beginning Sunday, and she'll be here for a week. And um, next month, July, Krishnas is going to be at the Wilshire Ebel Theater. We're just 
Stay connected. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. We're so blessed. Our cup truly won it over. And uh, let's not take that for granted. And uh, that brings uh, me to the introduction tonight. Um, I'm very emotional um, because this is a being who not only has touched me and is significant to my life, he's so significant to my friends. So his beingness, not only his teachings, but who he is, the being that he is, reaches so many people I know and continues to do so. And uh, he's a very important person in my family, both my parents, when they found out that I was going to be with him tonight. They live in different parts of the world. They were very envious of me. <laughs> Um, he's just very much loved in my life and the lives of so many. So it's hard to, um, you know, how do you, how do you thank somebody for being a living embodiment of the fruits of the spiritual path and a living embodiment of compassion who is just showing up is a statement and there's an exchange there, there's a teaching there of for me, I describe it as just great compassion. And I think one of the things that the world can use a lot more of right now is compassion. So every being, in every walk of life, in every line of work, arts, music, um, teaching, medical profession, whatever we do in this world, and however we do it, compassion is a key, a key ingredient that uh, is a gift that we can give to this planet right now. So, um, more than any person I've ever pers I've ever met or seen, um, this is his gift to us. His book is called The Journey Home, and it nourishes every person who I've heard has picked it up. Every single person. And there are many thousands at this point. I've, I know hundreds of them, personally. And the book spiritually nourishes them. Just by holding it, you know, and eventually reading it, and um, people the world over are loving this book. So I do want to mention, if you haven't gotten the book, The Journey Home, please don't leave here tonight without getting the book. And you can purchase the book on the way out. And um, also our Prasad Lalas who brought the food to us just that way. We're grateful. And, uh, and we're grateful for our leader's presence tonight. It's with all the respect I have in my heart. And please join me as we all welcome our friend to the path, His Holiness, Radhanath Swami Maharaj. Shake Krishna, shake Krishna. 
that money cannot buy the most important things in life. <clears throat> cannot buy peace. Cannot buy happiness. Cannot buy love. Cannot buy unity of a family. And he went on and on and on. And I was just quietly listening. And after he made about a three minute list of what money can't buy, I said, then why do you work so hard for money? <laughs> and he said, because it's nice to have the things that it can buy. So I thought that was a really good answer. <laughs> But I often give an example of when I was with Mother Teresa in 1971 in Calcutta. And she spoke something to me that has never left my mind. It's such a universal truth. She said, the real problem in this world is hunger. Not hunger of the belly, hunger of the heart. And she explained how in the ghettos of Calcutta so many people are starving. And she gives them food. And she gives them medical relief and all of that. And it's good. But what they're really searching for, what people are really hungry for, is love. That's the only thing that can actually nourish and satisfy the heart to love and to be loved. She told me that she travels around the world and she goes to New York and Los Angeles and London and Paris and all these places and she meets very prominent people. She said they're starving. She said these dying people in Calcutta, when they die in my arms, I see a light in their eyes that I rarely see other places. And the origin of that propensity to love within everyone is coming from our very true self, the Atma, or the conscious life that is within us, which we sometimes call the soul. In Sanskrit, it's the Atma, the living force. That person within us that's seeing through our eyes and hearing through our ears and tasting through our tongue and smelling through our nose and feeling through our flesh and loving through our heart and thinking through our brain. Rarely do people even ask, who am I, in a serious way because we're just so caught up in all of the, as my friend Cornel West used to say, weapons of mass distractions. <laughs> <laughs> we're so distracted from what we really want and what we really need. We rarely really ask what is my real want and need? Who am I? It is said in the Bhagavad Purana that when you put water on the root of the tree, that water naturally expands and extends to every part of the tree. The flowers, the roots, the twigs, the leaves. And in the same way, when our love is poured, our Supreme Mother, our Supreme Father, our Supreme Love. We call it Krishna or Ram or God. He has many names in various spiritual traditions. But that love between the soul and God is the origin of all love. And when we connect to that love and understand our own true self beyond birth, beyond death, beyond all the dualities and all the changes that are constantly taking place in this world. And that love naturally extends toward all of the beings. There's a particular verse in the Bhagavad Gita when I first heard it, I was thinking, 
this is what I'm looking for. It kind of converted me. May I share that person? <laughs> What is real learning? Now I have to give a little background context. I went to one semester of a junior college. <laughs> and I told my mother and father, I'm going to Europe on a summer vacation and I'll be back for the next semester of college. That was in 1970. <laughs> <laughs> Still haven't made it back. <laughs> but I ended up hitchhiking from Europe and from the Middle East and to India and wandered around. And I was really seeking a higher education in my own way. This particular verse in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna tells, what is real wisdom or knowledge? Not just how much data we can accumulate in our brains, but real wisdom is the capacity to see every living being with equal vision. Whether one is black or white or red or yellow or brown or male or female, or whether one is rich or poor or from the east or the west, or whether one is a Jew or a Christian or a Muslim or a Jain or a Parsi or a Zoroastrian or a Sikh or a Hindu or a Buddhist or an agnostic or an atheist, the Gita, she was a wonderful to see. Or whether one is a human, or an elephant, or a cow, or a dog, or a cat. Wherever there's life, there's a sacred part of God. Life is sacred. If we can't recognize the sacredness of our own life, we cannot recognize it anywhere else. But if we recognize that sacredness within ourselves, of who we really are, then we will actually see every living being as our brothers and sisters. That's a universal principle. However much our spiritual path is actually bringing us to this understanding, we're actually benefiting from it. I just met my dear new friend, Forrest. And I'd like to speak something about the forest. Recently, I went with a dear friend of mine to the Muir Woods. Mm. How many of you have been there? It's just close to San Francisco. Mm. It's a redwood forest. It's incredible. Um, I'm from Illinois. <laughs> we just don't have redwood trees there. <laughs> And I hitchhiked to the Middle East. They just don't have rainbow trees. <laughs> and India, they don't have either. They're the biggest trees in the world. And as we're walking through, um, it's just so still. Even if people try to make noise, it seems like the thick bark of the redwood trees just kind of absorbs it, and it's always really quiet. We came to a clearing where a forest ranger was speaking to a group of tourists. He was telling the underground secret of the Redwood Forest. Now, having been a teenager in the 1960s, I'm still very inclined toward underground secrets. <laughs> <laughs> He explained that for a tree to have strength, as it grows higher and higher, its roots require being deep. But the redwood trees, the roots do not grow deep. And yet, they're the tallest trees in the world. 
the largest trees in the world, there in Northern California, the soil is really loose. It's hilly, not flat. And these trees, some of them are a couple thousand years old. They have been standing through massive earthquakes, blizzards, freezing winters, and windstorms. How do they stand? <clears throat> Then he paused so that we could think about it. <coughs> the secret of the redwood trees is the roots grow underground, not too deep under, outward, reaching for the roots of other redwood trees. And as soon as two redwood roots meet, they walk, they wrap against around each other. They intertwine and make a permanent bond. In this way, every tree in the forest is directly or indirectly interconnected with every other tree in the forest. Now these trees that are thousands of years old, their huge roots are reaching out to the new vulnerable trees, which is everywhere skinny roots and they wind around them and they get all the support of these giants. Unity is their strength. And in the same way, human society, unity is our strength. In Sanskrit there is something called satsai or satikirtai means when we come together because the roots of our real consciousness is our heart's affection. When we actually interconnect with this spiritual focus with each other, recognizing each other as children of the same supreme being, <laughs> recognizing that that another's happiness is my happiness. Another's suffering is my suffering. According to the Vedas, this is the definition of a saintly person. This type of humility, or as she will say, this type of compassion. And as we are there for each other on this spiritual principle, we actually discover what real love is. Bhagavad Gita tells that the intelligent person is one that rejoices with him, who is enlightened with him, and who finds great pleasure with him. And when we find it there, then whatever our occupation may be, it's not that we need to get something to be happy. We utilize whoever we are and whatever we know how to do to share that happiness. I remember some years ago I was giving a lecture in a university in Mumbai. I live in Mumbai, in India. And one thing you want to be really careful of, if you ever are in this situation, is if you're giving a lecture in a college in Mumbai, if you ask for questions. <laughs> <laughs> so this happened to be a school of accountants. Everyone in this college was learning how to be either a chartered accountant or a certified accountant or whatever other kind of accountants there are. <laughs> so I kind of spoke what I speak and I asked for questions. There was about 300 people in this auditorium and one person raised his hand. And 
as naive as I could be, I said, yes. <laughs> he stood up, and everyone in the auditorium went, mm -hmm. <laughs> I was a little alerted by that. <laughs> he started screaming at me, really angry, defiant. He said, you are a cheater. You are, he had a microphone too, because I passed microphones around. He said, you are a cheater. You are simply misleading us. He said, what would happen if, to the world if everyone became a Swami like you? Who would do the banking? Who would grow the food? Who would protect the, the citizens? Who would run the governments? He said, therefore, you are cheating us, and I reject everything you spoke. He spoke that with so much passion and conviction, he got a massive standing ovation. They were cheering, they were howling, they were clapping. And, I, and they were all looking at me on the stage. <laughs> quite quiet. <laughs> Dentists and doctors and entertainers, there's a need for accountants, and there's a need for swamis like me too. <laughs> we all have something to contribute. Let us look at it in this way. We're all like different limbs and organs of the same body. Because society is called sometimes a social body. And every part of the body is very different. The pancreas cannot do what the ears do. And the eyes cannot do what the kidneys do. And the... I'm not going to get into too many private areas. <laughs> the heart cannot do what the brain can do. Each of these organs have their own color, have their own shape, and have their own function. But they're all serving unitedly at the roots of the redwood tree for the whole of the body. And to the degree there's that unity of every part of the body, every part of the body is happy. Because the body's healthy. So a healthy human society is when we can learn to recognize and appreciate everybody's contribution if they're honestly, earnestly, and morally and spiritually doing the right thing. Whatever our differences may be. So let us work together. Now I'm shunned to tell you this. But I got a louder standing <laughs> is to love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And what is the natural consequence of loving God? That you will, make, you will love your neighbor as yourself. Naturally, everyone is our neighbor. Not only every human, but every living being is our neighbor. The trees, the rivers, the oceans, the sky, can I tell another story? <laughs> Once I was, I, I took several thousand people on a pilgrimage in Vrindavan in India. And afterward, I was really tired. And I was supposed to take an airplane from Delhi back to Mumbai. I wanted to 
share something I heard today. My dear friend Eric, when he was 14 years old, he liked the Beatles. I think everybody when they're 14 years old. <laughs> and they went to India. So he just went to India. He didn't tell his parents. <laughs> he just got on a plane from Montreal and went to India. And he called his mother and he said, I'm in, she said, where are you? He said, I'm in New Delhi. She said, well, which New Delhi? I'll come in. <laughs> for the environment, that is, the person who's in charge of the environment for the entire country of India is sitting close by and she wants to talk to you. So I said, sure. So she came up. Her name was Maneka Gandhi. She was the daughter-in-law of Indira Gandhi. And she was really an activist for the environment. She challenged me. She said, what are you swamis and yogis and monks doing for the environment? Look, the sky is being polluted, the land is being polluted, the rivers are being polluted, and she started telling me all these statistics about the pollution. She went on and on. The forests are being cut down. The oxygen is being disturbed. There's so much pollution everywhere. It's causing so much disease. It's unsustainable. And you're just meditating. <laughs> and saying prayers. And doing pujas. What are you, swamis and yogis and sadhus, doing for the environment? there's so much pollution in the environment is because there's pollution in people's hearts. Toxic arrogance, greed, anger. This is what's polluting the world. The world is a manifestation of what's in humans' minds. To you. I told her, if you clean every river and every ocean and the sky and the mountains and everything else, which would be a great thing, if we don't clean people's minds, they don't have higher values, they don't respect nature, respect their neighbors, they're just going to pollute it all over again. So we, should, we should all be working together. Yes, we need to clean these things on a physical level. But we also have to educate our children and educate ourselves to respect the environment, to honor Mother Earth, and to honor all of the children of God and Mother Earth. Mrs. Gandhi said to me, she said two things. She said, they're calling me for my flight. <laughs> <laughs> but then she did pronouns, and she said, what you're saying is true. We have to work together. So it is very important. When I was 
Thomas Young. I was very much involved in the civil rights movement. This is just after Martin Luther King um, was taken from us. And many things inspired me to do this, but one of them was I heard him say that if you do not have an ideal you're ready to die for, you have nothing very meaningful to live for. I was just a teenager at that time. And that was my craving to find something I was willing to die for. An ideal. Something valuable. Something meaningful. Because I knew if I didn't find it, I really didn't have anything very purposeful to me to live for. And in our spiritual journey, to find that eternal nature within us, to find that love, to experience God's love. We call God in our tradition Krishna all attractive. And to be an instrument of God's love in whatever we do. And I have seen some of the most saintly people who are industrious, who are business, scientists, musicians, entertainers, bankers, farmers, teachers, even swamis. <laughs> Our Shamsundar, one of my very dearest Blessed friends, who's with us tonight. He was my Guru Srila Prabhupada's personal secretary for seven years. And he was such a pioneer of this spiritual path of bhakti or devotion. And he actually he lived with George Harrison in his house for, the, for almost a year, I think, yes. John Lennon's house, George Harrison's house. And they just loved him so dearly. When George was passing away in Los Angeles, he called for Sean We were together in Vrindavan, in the holy place of India. He got a call from George's wife, and he said, I have to go. And Sean Sundar was there when George came to our guru and said, you know, I really want to live a spiritual life. I want to shave my head and move in the ashram. Yes, and Prabhupada said, there's no need. He said, you're a musician. You have such wonderful talent. Use that talent to enlighten people. And he did. How many people do you like by his music? So real bhakti, real spirituality is not about changing our particular role in society. It's changing our consciousness, changing our ideals, being an instrument of a grace that's beyond ourselves. And that takes humility, it takes gratitude, and it takes a lot of inspiration. Shridhar, he arranges Bhakti Fest and our beloved Shiva Ray is a great inspiration for so many of us. Trying to actually spread that grace through bringing, our, bringing each other together where our roots <coughs> despite all of our differences, can actually be connected on this higher principle. I'm going to end with one little story. This is a story that was told in the year 
1127. That's about a thousand years ago. It's in a history book in South India that I read. There was a great saint. His name was Ramanuja. Even to this day, a thousand years later, he has tens and millions of followers. And the biggest temples in India are people who are following him in the south. His successor was Parasara. When Parasara was five years old, he was living in a holy place called Sri Ranga. At that time, the greatest sport in India, if you take basketball, football, baseball, hockey, soccer, cricket, all these sports put together, they did not mount to the popularity of this one sport in India in those days. It was debate. <laughs> if you were a debate champion, you were the star, superstar. So this particular person was the all Indian debate champion. And he, he just knew so much logic and scripture and, and knowledge of every sort. And he was very proud. He came to the town riding on a palanquin. So in those days, they didn't have nice cars or anything. He had a beautifully decorated palanquin. And he had marching bands all around him. And he had Brahmins chanting mantras and, and, and verses. And it was being proclaimed. He has come to challenge anyone to a debate. There is no question he cannot answer. So all the scholars, they all ran away because they knew they could not face him. The little Parasana was five years old. And he ran up to the bell and said, I have a question for you. This man looked down. He's a senior man. He said, what do you know, you child? He said, I have a question for you. He said, your mother's milk is still on your lips. Go home. <laughs> he said, if you're so learned, then why are you evaluating my size? <laughs> the man said, debate is for um, mature scholars, not for children. And the boy said, but I have a question for you. He said, what is your question? The little child reached down and picked up a handful of sand. I held it up to the man and said, how many grains of sand are in my hand? <laughs> the man was speechless. <laughs> He couldn't answer the question. It was the first time a person asked a question that he couldn't answer. Because everybody was always asking a philosophical question. <laughs> he was speechless. Because the boy had no malice. He was a child. He said, a great person is like a tree with many fruits. If a tree has many fruits, it's always bending down to others. If a tree has no fruits, it's standing up very straight like that. He said, if you have no humility, then all of your knowledge is as worthless as this sand. And then he threw the sand to the ground. The man he was defeated. He got down off his palaquin and bowed at the feet of a five-year-old boy and said, you're my guru, please teach me. And he became a saintly person. 
Years later, Bhat Parasara became a grown guru. <laughs> and he had so many followers. One day one of his followers asked him, what are the, what are the qualities required to understand our true self? Parasara said, there is a person in Tirupati, on top of a mountain named Ananta. He could best answer this question. He said, because I don't really know the answer. <laughs> so this person had to walk. 700 miles. Because in those days you had to walk. You had to walk through forests, cross rivers, you had to climb seven mountains, and finally he came to the hermitage of Ananda. And he said, My guru, Parasar, asked me to come here to ask you this question. What are the qualities of one to really know one's true self and one's relationship with the Supreme? And now to suddenly think about it. I'll answer the question later. He was there on this lonely mountain for six months. And Ananda never answered his question. And he was afraid to ask him again, because he already said he would answer it. So he was there doing his seva, his service, and he was listening to talks, and he was doing meditation, and he was helping so many people, just waiting for the answer. And one day, there was a big festival. And thousands of people were coming for food, prasad, holy food. And he was asked to serve it. So the first batch was many hundreds of people. He served the whole first batch, and then he sat down to eat. And Ananda came up to him and said, serve the next batch. So he put down his food and served the next batch. He sat down to eat. Ananda said, there's still more people. Serve the next batch. He served about five batches of people until it was late at night and the whole field was empty. There was nobody else around. He was all alone with his little plate of food. And he sat down to eat. And then Ananda came up to him again. Now, he can't tell him to serve the next batch because there's nobody else there. It's the middle of the night. And Nanda said, I believe you had a question for me. What is your question? <laughs> he got really excited. <laughs> so what are the qualities of a self-realized person? And Nanda said, a self-realized person is like salt is like a chicken, is like a crane, and is like you. That's all I have to say. And he walked away. <laughs> he was thinking, I waited six months. <laughs> so he... He climbed down the seven mountains. <laughs> he crossed all the rivers. He walked 700 kilometers through forests. And finally came back to Sri Rama. And there he saw Parasara, his guru. And Parasara said, oh, did you ask him your question? It was a long time ago, wasn't it? <laughs> he said, I did. He said, oh, what was the answer? He said, he told me that, a, that an enlightened person is like salt and like a chicken <laughs> and like a crane. Like me. And Parasara said, ah, fantastic, comprehensive answer that is. <laughs> so I'm bewildered. What does salt and chickens have to do with the people? <laughs> Do I have time to explain? Yeah. <laughs> Parasara said, I will now 
share with you the fathomless wisdom of Ananda. Now, I'm going to be real, real brief. <laughs> because it's, it, this answer could be elaborated in so many beautiful ways. The quality of salt. How many when you're eating food think the salt in this food is fantastic? Usually you think the grains are fantastic or the, or the, the spices, but the salt, nobody talks about salt. Nobody praises salt. But yet salt gives so much flavor. And similarly, an enlightened person is willing to do so much for the pleasure of others in the service of God, but doesn't want credit. Is willing to do it out of love. And similarly, the quality of salt is if there's too much, the food is unpalatable. And if there's too little, it's not very good. It has to be just right. In the same way, an enlightened person is balanced. And this is taught in the Bhagavad Gita. There Krishna tells that a self-realized person is one who does not eat too much or too little, sleep too much or too little, who's balanced in recreation, in their spiritual um, practices, balance is so very important for sustainable spiritual growth. Like salt. And for each of us, we may have need our own particular balance according to who we are. Another quality of salt is it's so eager to make the preparation nice, it merges itself into the preparation. And in the same way, as an enlightened person absorbs herself or his self in our loving service to the Lord, in our saving to other people, and in our spiritual practices, to actually be absorbed. The quality of a chicken. Now usually if somebody calls you a chicken, you're insulted. But here, it's considered the greatest praise to be compared to a chicken. <laughs> In the sense that a chicken will go to a rubbish heap, a pile of rubbish, and collect the nutritious little seeds that are in that rubbish and leave the rest behind. In the same way, an enlightened person is Sara Grati, which means one who seeks the essence, one who looks for the good in others and brings that out. It's like our Guru Srila Prabhupada when he was at Shamsundar. We notice if he saw a spark of goodness in someone's heart. He would just focus on that little spark and fan it and make it into, and appreciate it so much that he just wanted it to grow into a blazing fire. Anybody can find faults. But to actually see the good and nourish the good in oneself and in others is a saintly quality. To seek the essence also of our spiritual practices. Because in the name of religion, which is supposed to bring about love and compassion and happiness, historically, every religion, not just one or two, every religion I've ever studied has a history of sectarianism, egoism, hatred, prejudice, 
violence. But we also find in those same religions love, peace, compassion, goodness. So we have our rituals, we have our philosophical explanations. But what is the essence of the transformation that's supposed to take place by understanding this? If, we, if we're not focused on that essence, then the same thing that's supposed to bring out purity can create terrible impurity. The same principles, the same practices, the same understandings that are supposed to bring out love can bring out hate. But like the chicken, we seek the essence. And also in situations, oh, opportunities are there in, even in crises. Throughout history, great people are people, even when things were really difficult, they saw opportunities. In my own little life, can I distract to another listener? <laughs> Tell me if I'm going over time. So, <clears throat> my father, he grew up in the Depression, struggled like anything. His parents, escaping persecution, came to America. Um, we had a little house in a nice neighborhood. And he worked so hard and invested all of his money in a particular business enterprise. He was an automobile dealer. And the automobile he selected to dedicate everything he had to selling was called the Edsel. <laughs> Have you heard of the Edsel? <laughs> um, he went in total bankruptcy. He lost everything. And the tax collectors were trying to take everything else away. And he was struggling and working like 15, 18 hours a day to try to somehow or other just keep us alive. And we had one bathroom in the house, and three bedrooms. And myself and my brother, we shared the same bedroom. It was right next to the bathroom. And I would hear my father every morning taking his shower. And he would always sing the same song. It was a song by Al Jolson. When April showers come your way, they bring the flowers, they bloom in but he sang it with such feeling. It was like a prayer. <laughs> because he believed so strongly that this crisis of bankruptcy was going to provide something wonderful if he just saw the opportunity. And because he had that hope, and because he had that confidence, that positiveness, he worked really hard. He knew something wonderful would happen. And it did. He became quite wealthy. But to tell you the truth, he, came, he became wealthy already after I was in India and became a Swami. <laughs> <laughs> but like the chicken, Whatever the situation is, we can seek the essence. There's something to learn, some way to grow, some opportunity that's there in everything. And I'm going to end with the crane. The crane, it's a bird, stands on one leg in a stream of water. And so many little fish are swimming by. Thousands of little fishers, and the crane's just looking down. Patient, just watches. When a big fish comes, <laughs> he eats it. <laughs> what does that have to do with us? Everything. Not that we have to eat fish. <laughs> The principle is he focused 
on what's really important, what's really significant, on the big things in life. And he let all the little things just pass. Whether it's in marriage, whether it's in friendship, whether it's in politics, whether it's in whatever, religion, we become so distracted by little things. And oftentimes those little things could create so much conflict between people. But if we're actually <laughs> focusing on what's really important in life, then we see the little things for what they are. We patiently just let them pass. If we don't see the big picture of what life is really for, and all these little situations that come upon us can distract us and cause so much comfort. But when you really seek any shafa, knock on the door will open. And the Gita. The Gita tells us that. Yeah, he says, what is that? Um, that those who are on this path are resolute in purpose. Their aim is the big things. <laughs> how to actually become enlightened, how to actually see the godliness in others and in every situation. But those who are not trying to focus in this way, there are very many branched domains. Yavashayatma ka buddhya eke ha kuru nandana bhushaka yanantarja budayo yavashaya. This is a universal principle. And that's why gatherings like tonight are so special. Because whoever we are, people from all different places, I come from India, we're all coming together to help focus on these bigger picture of life. And like the cream, feast on the beauty of God's grace. It's within all of us, everywhere. And then all the little distractions of this world and the dualities of the world is that deal with them, but not be disturbed by them. In this kirtan, or the congregational chanting of these mantras, these beautiful holy names, is for that purpose. It's a wonderful spiritual practice where we can all come together and our many voices become one voice. Our many, vo our many hearts become one heart. As we, the roots of our consciousness are interconnected through this beautiful chant. It could give us strength, it could give us peace, it could help us to be instruments of real love. Thank you. Do we have little cure time? Do we have time? Do we have a few minutes? You sure? Okay. Would you like to sit or dance? If you like to sit, sit, if you like to dance. <laughs>
Holy Spirit. 